The Pitt Lecture is given in alternate years at Berkeley Divinity School in memory of Lewis Weatherby Pitt. In fact, Lewis Pitt's father and son. And it's my sad uh, duty to mention that since the last Pitt Lecture was held here in person, uh, the Reverend uh, Lewis Pitt has gone to his rest. Uh, the Pitt Lecture, which is uh, a memorial for that family, has had two focal points, uh, one of which is the idea of bringing great preachers to Berkeley and Yale, and the other is to bring people who are leaders in world Christianity. And often the dean and the faculty have to think among themselves about, well, who did we have last time, a great preacher or a world Christian leader? And, and you can see where I'm going, because this year, this year we managed to get both. Uh, Lewis Weatherby Pitt would have been delighted that Vicente Gabe is the, the giver of this year's uh, lecture. He was uh, someone who served himself as a missionary in Zambia and held Africa very close to his own heart, even though being someone who was a product of the school who represented our motto into the, the regions beyond. We conceptualize the reality of mission somewhat differently on a global basis now. We understand that our mutuality and interdependence are not simply that of one wealthy and privileged entity giving things to another place in need. Rather, we've often become conscious in recent years that churches in many parts of Africa are the givers of gifts to us, of a lively faith, of enthusiasm, of deep insight. And so it is our great pleasure to welcome Dr. Kagabe here. And uh, as we met for the first time last night, we both instantly smiled and mentioned how long it had taken this meeting to come about, because even before she was elected Bishop of Lesotho, when she was principal of the College of the Transfiguration, we had been uh, not only scheming to get her to come uh, physically before, but had also sent students before who had gone and undertaken short uh, learning experiences with their colleagues at the College of the Transfiguration. And our, our hope is that we will actually continue to, to build on her visit, not only perhaps by building links with Lesotho, but also by sending students, faculty, and others to the College of the Transfiguration and welcoming them as visitors here at Yale Divinity School. We're going to begin that in March by taking the Berkeley seniors to South Africa, and they will spend roughly half of a week as uh, visitors and uh, exchanges in fellowship with uh, the staff and students of the College of the Transfiguration. So this is a fruit that is born of seeds that we planted some years ago. Uh, you have already heard her very distinguished uh, curriculum vitae, which I won't repeat. Let me then simply encourage you to join me in welcoming our pit lecturer for 2023, the Right Reverend Dr. Vicentia Gabe. COVID-19 pandemic has caused many of us to reflect on the leadership within the church. What lessons have we learned and what type of leaders does the church truly deserve? During one of my visits to a church located deep in the Maluti Mountains in Lesotho, I had the privilege on conversing with an elderly member of our church and community. When I asked her about the type of leaders we need, she looked deeply into my eyes and replied, we need leaders who look like my savior, Jesus Christ. In this lecture, I will outline the leadership model that I believe from my context, we should strive and to emulate, and I hope you can copy it. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. 
Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. This is Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 to 38. As Jesus gazed out at the people gathered about him, Matthew says he was filled with compassion. Their pain, their loneliness, their grief, it all became his. He saw just how harassed and helpless they were. His response to their plight was a divine, loving compassion. Matthew chapter 9, 35 to 38 is structured around three themes. The first one is inclusion. The second one is divine compassion and messianic hope. And the third part is harvest celebration and eschatological fulfillment. Matthew builds on the reader's escalated sense of comparing the crowds to sheep without a shepherd. He's drawing from important Old Testament imagery which describes Israel as God's sheep. The use of this metaphor in Matthew 9, 36 vividly and powerfully portrays the condition of Israel during the ministry of Jesus, lacking not just political leadership, but spiritual care and guidance as well. As individuals and as a collective, they were a sheep without shepherd. Among the many Old Testament use of the shepherd sheep motif, Ezekiel chapter 34 presents a unique backdrop for the understanding in the, in the intertextual assumptions at work within Matthew 9:36. And Ezekiel chapter 34 portrays the tragic tragedy of Israel's failed leadership called shepherds, as well as God's purpose to restore hope under an idealized future shepherd. Jesus was moved with compassion. Compassion is described as a response to suffering that involves cognitive awareness, empathy, and action to alleviate suffering. The concept of compassion is the foundation of Jesus' mission. Christianity is based on the biblical account that begins with a loving God who was moved by the pleas of God's people and concludes with a story of Christ as the embodiment of a compassionate God. It was compassion that compelled Jesus to take on our human flesh in the first place. Compassion prompted him to pour himself out to death on a cross. Compassion is the motive behind Jesus' action of proclaiming, healing, and inviting people to the table. Annette Mears writes that Jesus' compassionate practice aims to create new communities or restore damaged relationships within the socially excluded, close quote. Jesus observed the pain and suffering of the afflicted and prayed for divine intervention. He referred to God as the Lord of the harvest and implored God to provide help and relief to the community that was experiencing this hardship. The metaphor of harvest used by Jesus in chapter 9 of Matthew's gospel recalls the importance of agriculture and the hope of eschatology. Harvest was of great significance in ancient Israel because it was the primary factor in determining the cycles of culture. The year began with fasting while waiting for the rains, and it ended with feasting in celebration of the harvest. The calendar of the ancient Israel was based on the importance of harvest as a season of joy, expectation, hope, 
and trust in God's sovereign care. Compassionate leaders are, urgent, are urgently needed in both church and society. Miriam Webster Dictionary describes compassion as a sympathetic consciousness of others' distress together with a desire to alleviate it. And it comes from Latin, the Latin word compati, meaning to bear. The compassionate love Jesus feels moves him to solve the problems of the suffering. Hence, everything Jesus thought or said or did in his mission to salvage humankind was motivated by compassionate love. Jesus demonstrated that his mission, his mandate, should be done on the platform of genuine compassionate love. This is why in the Gospels, he was described as always being moved by compassion. We have an African proverb that states, a kind gesture can reach a wound that only compassion can heal. Our mission as church is to embody compassion and serve our community with kindness and empathy. Jesus demonstrated that his followers are to carry on the mission mandate of the church in compassionate love. But in this era that we find ourselves in, the church has undergone a paradigm shift from this model of Jesus' compassion. The church, maybe not in your context, but in my context, has in the past years or past decades been a source of pain and strife. This has contributed to many losing faith or having trouble relating to God. There's no tip gospels, the Gospel of John and the Book of Acts all convey a message that was given to the church. As the church, our purpose is to bring the life-changing power of Jesus Christ to our communities, to our region, and this world. This mission is not just about spreading the gospel to as many people as possible, but it's about creating disciples who can in turn make more disciples. It is about being so deeply impacted by the gospel that it transforms us and allows us to impact others. C.S. Lewis wrote, the church exists for no other purpose but to draw people into Christ. If it fails to do that, then everything else, including cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, even the Bible itself, is simply a waste of time. The sole reason for God's becoming human was to achieve this purpose, close code. The church is in dire need of compassionate leadership that places great emphasis on understanding and relating to the struggles of her members. Compassionate leaders prioritize empathy, kindness, and support which are essential to building a strong and vibrant community. They understand that fear-based leadership can be damaging and instead they inspire and motivate through positive reinforcement and encouragement. Furthermore, compassionate leaders practice self-compassion, recognizing the importance of caring for themselves to better care for those they lead. Leadership that values compassion and empathy is crucial to the success and growth of any church community. It is crucial to identify and support those who are experiencing harassment and helplessness in God's vineyard in the church. The church and its leaders play a significant role in responding to such situations. While I can stand here and compile a list of those who have been harassed and excluded based on their own experience or context, it would be unfair because I will leave others out. We need to be attentive to all forms of harassment, abuse, 
neglect, exclusion, isolation, and profiling that have long-lasting negative effects on individuals and families. Unfortunately, the church is not immune to, to individuals who abuse their powers and position to cause harm. These perpetrators and bullies can cause immense injury to those in their care. And it is the responsibility of the church, us and its leaders, to take appropriate measures to prevent and address such situations. It is essential to create a safe environment where everyone can thrive and grow in their faith. Therefore, the church must take a proactive approach to identify and respond to any form of harassment, abuse, or neglect, ensuring that those affected receive the support they need. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his book, Prisoner of God, Letters and Papers from Prison, he wrote, the church is the church only when it exists for others, not dominating, but helping and serving. It must tell people of every calling what it means to live for Christ, to exist for others. The purpose of the church is not merely to maintain or expand its membership, but to serve humanity and the world by fulfilling its entrusted mission. As previously, previously stated by the second bishop of the Diocese of Lesotho, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, when he said, evil, injustice, oppression, all of those awful things, they are not going to have the last word. Goodness, laughter, joy, caring, compassion, the things that you do and you, and, and you help others do, those are going to prevail. The earliest communities that followed Christ do not have to be told to be compassionate to the poor and the marginalized. They merely did what they had seen Christ do and taught. They healed the sick and the physically challenged. They made sure that no one among them was in need. They ensured that the most vulnerable in their communities were properly taken care of. They taught that the only sure sign of Christ was if the widow and the orphans were cared for. One of the fundamental principles of Christian ministry is to minister to the poor, excluded and marginalized. This involves providing them with the necessary support and resources to uplift their lives and help them achieve a better future. It is not enough to have proper theology. One must also demonstrate the reality of the kingdom of God through their action. This is where preaching the message of justification by faith is complemented by practical demonstration of love, compassion, and generosity towards those in need. Injustice and a lack of concern often results in neglecting the needs of those who live on the margins of society. Gregory Nazius and Gregory of Nyasa not only preach about compassion for lepers, the poor, and the homeless, but they also provided relief and set up homes for those in need. All the teachings emphasize that the only way one could demonstrate that they were true followers of Christ was if they showed mercy and compassion towards others. As Polycarp wrote, this act of compassion will ensure that God's name will not be blasphemed and thus be a witness to the others about the nature and character of God. As I conclude, Jesus Christ prayed to God of the harvest to send laborers to the vineyard. We must also pray for theological institutions, church organizations, and all our dioceses, and those who provide education, formation, and training of faith leaders. 
We pray that these faith leaders that will be formed and educated may not only be theologically sound, but also compassionate and empathetic. As Eleanor Roosevelt once said, to handle yourself, use your head. To handle others, use your heart. Compassionate leaders lead and manage with both their head and their hearts. I